continuing sending out that beautiful light, we come to our prayer for humanity. We remember the great need of our world, and we seek to still our mind so that we come into a place of peace and deep stillness, drawing closer to God in prayer. Let us open our hearts to the power, love, and wisdom of God. And by the Christ's light and love in our hearts, we call to the great angels of the Christ star circle. Being still, we feel their presence and their power. And now, with all the will of our minds, with all the love of our deepest hearts, we send forth the light. We send it forth as a great star of light, a blazing star, a star of the Christ light, lifting all hearts into the eternal heart of God. By all the power of Christ within our hearts, we send forth the light to the world. And we hold our beautiful planet in the healing light of the Christ star. We hold within this healing ray the waters of the earth and the air and all nature, especially the human and animal kingdoms. And we hold in this healing light the soul of humanity and all kingdoms of life. We see this light providing strength for the journeys on the evolutionary path. And now we hold in the heart of the Christ star the soul of the Americas, the soul of the peoples of the Americas. May the light of the Christ star shine through the hearts and minds of the people of the Americas to bring healing to mankind and reverence for all life. And let us now hold within this great healing star anyone known to us personally who is in need of help or healing. Silently, we name them now and see them perfect in this radiant healing light. Amen. Now continuing this beautiful healing work, after that heavenly music, we come together for our healing circle. Let us open our hearts to the Christ power, wisdom, and love, as together we call upon the angels of healing to draw close. We feel their presence and their power. And as they draw closer, we see the angels of the Christ star circle ministering to all those in need of any type of support. But today, as we come into the soft radiance of this love, we focus and hold the healing light of the Christ star over all our family of humanity that has gone through sudden loss of loved ones, no matter what the incident. 
we see them embraced in that beautiful rose ray in the all-embracing love of Divine Mother. We see their souls being guided and protected as they journey home and their families embraced and supported by this healing, radiant light. With hearts full of love and gratitude, we give our grateful thanks. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Vicki has picked a beautiful reading on a White Eagle teaching, A323, which was given on January 10th, 1960. Beloved brethren, half the trouble on the physical plane of life is fear. Fear is man's great enemy. Fear for yourself, fear for your loved ones, and fear of the future. Now this fear is a great enemy to mankind. It produces sickness. It produces the passions which rise to defend itself from its so-called enemy, which brings about wars upon your earth, fear which would destroy in case the self is destroyed. Now if you can recognize this great enemy and overcome it, not by attacking it, but by recognizing by your side the loving master, the guide, the helper, surrendering in love to the guiding influence of the higher agencies, the guardian angel, the teacher, the protector. Now you will say, but we must reply upon ourselves. We have lives to live. In this hard world, we must protect ourselves. But we emphasize that the greatest protector that man can have is love. And if, following that protector, you feel that you're brought up to against impossible barriers in your life, remember that there's always a way through and over human problems, human difficulties. We have passed through in full consciousness the change called death, and we know that such an experience is the most beautiful thing in life. In life is death, and in death there is life. Every spirit that has already passed on will tell you that death was the most beautiful experience. The actual passing, the release of the spirit from the body, a most beautiful experience. Peace, release light, joy, beauty. No matter what the soul is, the life may be, have to be reviewed. And in that reviewing must come at times regret and grief for the pain and suffering caused to, caused to others. But nevertheless, we repeat, my friends, that in spite of what you see of the physical shell, which appears to be in great agony sometimes, the spirit is above it, and the consciousness of the life is in the spirit. God is love. God's ways are merciful, and even if man tries to confuse the issue by stupidity, by ignorance, by fear, God enfolds the spirit within loving arms. Never forget this. It will help you to live, and it will help you to die. And now remembering that you are spirit functioning through matter, you must be aware of that spirit life. You must learn to become receptive to the guardian angel, receptive to spiritual thought and spiritual ideas. In other words, man will and must in the future, in the very near future, Develop this power of receiving words and messages and ideas from other worlds, from higher planes. 
The trouble is that man pushes it out and says, it's only my imagination. Now, that is a downfall. When man says it's only imagination and casts it out, if everyone threw out the ideas which are impressed upon them, there would be no new ideas in your world at all, no inventions, no development of science. So remember, dear brethren, to train yourselves to enter that sanctuary of silence. Seek the place of God, the Holy Spirit. Seek communion with him who is all love, who came to demonstrate the power of love on earth, because this is man's way. This is man's path, the pathway of light, which is the pathway of love. If you don't give love, you must suffer. If you don't give love, your life will become more and more confused and painful. But with the development of love in your heart, life will become more harmonious, easier, and full of joy. Nothing of a worldly nature can touch you. The higher mind is awakening and will be used. And with the coming of this development, there will be an overcoming of time and space. There will be this center of life, and all beings will be attached to that center, and yet eternally free, free within the love of God. The world of spirit is your next step, and there you will find indescribable harmony, beauty, and wonders, of which the earthly mind has yet no conception. Look forward, my friends, to this unfolding and expanding life. May peace be in your heart, comfort in your soul, strength in your spirit, and as a shining star, move forward on the pathway of the new age of the spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Welcome. Denise, thank you for that beautiful reading. Today's talk and topic is the importance of um, overcoming fear and how to do it. The only way out is through. We all have fear, we all have doubt, we all have pain. And all of these are part of the physical manifestation here to teach us lessons. But it's important not to give power over to these fears and anxieties. Robin Sharma observes that the fears that we don't face become our limits. And Helen Keller, that great overcomer of fears, despite her total blindness, in total deafness, wrote, avoiding danger is no safer in the long run than outright exposure because the fearful are caught just as often as the bold. So being fearful serves no positive purpose in our lives. We gain strength, courage, and confidence by every experience in which you really stop and look fear in the face. You must do the thing that you think you cannot do. You must do the thing you fear. And today, we are going to do that together. We're going to face our fear and look it right in the face. I will be reading you parts of an article printed online in September of 2010 by Psychology Today. Overcoming Fear, The Only Way Out is Through, by Noam Svancer, Ph.D. 
And today we'll be talking not only of the spiritual treatment of fear, but also the psychological, emotional, and behavioral treatment of fear. A story about the Nobel Prize winning writer Isaac Bashiva Singer has him resting at home after receiving the news of his award being awarded the Nobel Prize. And a reporter appeared at his door and asked, Mr. Bashiva Singer, are you surprised? Are you happy? Of course, answered the elderly writer. I'm very surprised and happy. Ten minutes later, another reporter appears. Mr. Bashiva Singer, are you surprised? Are you happy? How long can a man remain surprised and happy, came the reply. Along with this late writer's wit, this anecdote illustrates the mechanism of habituation. Habituation, coming from the root word habit, is defined formally and refers to the fact that the nervous system arousal decreases on repeated exposure to the same stimulus. In layman's terms, it means that familiar things get boring and no longer bother us, no longer take a forefront in our mind. This mechanism is hardwired into the human genetic program. It has clear adaptive value because habituation to familiar stimuli allows more energy to be directed in our bodies to survive novel stimuli, hence improving the odds of survival. Some dramatic but not necessarily positive examples of habituation are children that live in a war zone and they become so inured to the bombs dropping and the people being killed and the rubble around them that they, but they continue to play. They become used to that as normal. Or the video game concept. Our children play such violent video games that it's no longer surprising to them to take up arms and kill people. But we want to use this principle of habituation in a positive manner to face our fears. The most important principle and application of the habituation principle has been in the area of anxiety treatment and fear treatment. Throughout my quotes in this article, I'm going to substitute the word anxiety for the word fear in order to show that the techniques for vanishing anxiety and fear are exactly the same. After all, in essence, fear and anxiety are the same thing and are synonymous in the human psyche. The experience of fear involves nervous system arousal. If your nervous system is not aroused, you can't experience fear. Understandably, but unfortunately, most people attempt to cope with feelings of fear by avoiding fear and avoiding any situations or objects that elicit feelings of fear. Avoidance, however, prevents your nervous system from habituating. Therefore, avoidance guarantees that the feared object or situation of fear will remain novel and therefore arousing in your psyche and hence anxiety and fear provoking. Moreover, avoidance tends to generalize over time. So if you avoid the elevator at work out of fear of elevators, you will soon begin to avoid all elevators and then all buildings that have elevators, etc. Soon enough, you've developed a quite serious neurosis and you'll be living in a prison of avoidance, a prison of fear. That's how neuroses develop. Moreover, when you avoid something that scares you, something that elicits fear in you, you tend to experience a sense of failure. Every time you avoid a feared object, a feared situation, your anxiety and your fear gain strength while you lose strength. You accumulate another experience of failure and another piece of evidence attesting to your own weakness. Finally, Avoidance eliminates practice. Without practice, it is difficult to gain mastery. Without mastery, confidence is less likely to arise in yourself. So, avoiding your fear, avoiding your anxiety, simply magnifies your fear and anxiety. 
To get rid of your fear, you should instead capitalize on the principle of habituation through the use of exposure. Exposure is by far the most potent medicine known to psychology, and it's also applicable spiritually. It is responsible, directly or indirectly, for most positive improvement achieved in therapy or in any self-work and self-growth but particularly in the treatment of fear and anxiety. Exposure entails facing your fears, which makes it aversive in the short term because it's initially unpleasant. But many worthy long-term goals entail short-term discomfort. Think about studying for an exam. Exposure seems counterintuitive, but many truths are counterintuitive. Think about the fact that we're residing on a ball floating out in the middle of space. Exposure scares people, but scary things are not necessarily dangerous. Think about roller coasters, horror films. Exposure is scary, is scary primarily because most people lacking an understanding of the habituation principle expect their fear to escalate indefinitely in the presence of a feared object or situation. But nothing arises indefinitely, and fear, if you face it, will soon begin to subside through the principle of habituation. Thus, with fear and anxiety, the only way out is through. If you're anxious about spiders, you need to handle spiders. You need to look at spiders. You need to study spiders. If you're scared of the elevator, you'll have to ride an elevator repeatedly. If you dread talking in class or talking in public, the only way to get over it is to start publicly talking. That's not easy to do since confronting your fear will produce a lot of initial anxiety. You'll have to stay in the feared situation and stay with the heightened fear response until it begins to subside, which it will, because it must by design, because that's how the human psyche works. Exposure works better than avoidance on the physiological level as well by bringing about nervous system habituation, which is the physiological antidote to anxiety. But it works better on three other levels as well. On the psychological level, confronting your fear instead of backing down brings about a sense of accomplishment and empowerment. Every time you confront your fear, you gain power. While your anxiety loses strength, your fear loses its power over you. I can tolerate it. It's difficult, but it's not impossible. It's not the end of the world. Every time you confront your fear, you accumulate evidence of your ability to cope. I did it yesterday, so I can do it again today. On the behavioral level, confronting your fear repeatedly helps develop skills and mastery. Mastery decreases the chance of failure and therefore reduces the need to worry, to be anxious, to be fearful. Finally, exposure is particularly useful on the emotional level. It turns out that many, perhaps all, fear and anxiety problems are at their core a fear of fear. Most people who fear crowds, elevators, planes, know that these objects in themselves are not dangerous. They most likely let their own kids go to the mall, ride on the elevator, or take a flight on a plane. What they fear are actually the sensations of the fear itself. Exposure to these sensations of fear allows you to habituate these sensations while at the same time improving the emotional literacy since staying in the terrain of fear helps to learn how to navigate, manage, and walk right through it. Exposure isn't easy. However, living in the prison of avoidance and the prison of fear isn't easy either, and it isn't much of a life. The short-term discomfort of exposure is the price we must pay to purchase a valuable long-term asset, a life free from debilitating anxiety and fear. 
I'll add my own two cents to the content of the article. Besides all of our mon mundane fears and anxieties, often our greatest fear is the fear of death. But if our belief is that only the physical body dies and is extinguished, and our soul and spirit live on, continually growing, continually evolving, continually expanding in love, then facing your fear of death head on, sitting with it, looking it in the eye, becoming comfortable with the concept of death, with what it actually is, a transition of the spirit out of this feeble body into the glorious love and recognition of your true nature, your true being, your true essence, your true self. When I was in my 20s, I went to New York City as an interpreter for a Mexican family who had an autistic child. And I worked with a psychologist and a therapist named Barry Neal Kaufman, who worked with uh, not only with autistic children with incredible success rates, but also had a therapy that he developed called option therapy. In essence, this is how option therapy works. Ask yourself, number one, what's your greatest fear? Then ask yourself, what's the worst thing that could happen if that fear comes to be? Now imagine that fear. And what's the worst thing that can happen if that fear comes to pass? You will eventually get to the end of the road, which is death. And again, if you believe, as we do, that death is simply a transition through a door into a more beautiful growth experience, then there's no fear of death. So if there's no fear of death, there should be no fear, logically, of anything that can happen to you while you're in this body. In the final analysis, the ultimate repercussion is death of the body. But if death of the body moves you into spirit, into light, into full recognition of your true identity and love, what, after all, is there ever to be afraid of while we're in the body? As Lao Tzu in the Tao Te Ching stated, there is no illusion greater than that of fear. So, face your fear. Look it right in the eye. Move into it. Live with it, be comfortable with it, and you will ultimately, and quicker than you think, transcend it. Bathe your fear in love and light. Become one with your fear. In bathing it in your love and light, you will clothe the fear in your pure essence, and you will be a witness to the melting away of that fear and your movement completely into love and light. Richie Norton asserts, to escape fear, you have to go through it. You cannot go around it. And Christine Evangelo wrote, change is supremely un inconvenient, uncomfortable, and naturally scary. Yet, we only move through life through the process of change, reinvention, and renewal. And so bravery is our quintessential rebel for pushing us past our own limited beliefs, behaviors, and fears. Bravery is feeling the fear, immersing yourself into the fear and through the fear so that you can come out the other side. Rovan and Shaw writes, one challenge at a time, I try to turn into the face of fear and tell it, you are not my master. You are the product of myself and I am your master. I look into the monster's eyes until it disappears. And then, and only then, am I free. And Jeanette Coran advises us, courage is not the absence of fear. It is to feel the fear and to face it anyway. Finally, Ellen Montgomery wrote in The Blue Castle, fear is the original sin. Suddenly said a still, small voice, away, way, back, back, back of Valancey's consciousness. Almost all the evil in the world has its origin in the fact that someone is afraid of something. 
Valancy stood up. She was still in the clutches of fear, but her soul was her own again. She would not be false to her inner voice. When I was going through my uh, labor with my, with my daughter Maya, I remembered as I went into the labor and went into that fear and pain of the contractions about the breathing and about moving into the pain and the fear. And I visualized that pain and fear as a wave in the ocean, and I just dove into it. And amazingly enough, I became one with the pain, and becoming one with it, I no longer felt it, and I was no longer fearful of it. And it was one of the most miraculous and transcendent experiences in my life. So now, we are going to do an exercise in facing our fear. I have put this together in the style of Thich Nhat Hanh's meditations. So close your eyes. We're calling in all of the angels, the great healers, and the greatest healer, the master healer. And we're asking all of these spiritual helpers to give us the strength and the courage to face our fear and to move into our fear and to vanquish our fear. So close your eyes and picture the biggest fear you have in your life right now. Look it in the face. Feel it. Taste it. Become it. Be it. Embrace that fear and bathe it in all of the love and light that is your true essence. Surrender that fear into the love and light that is absolutely your true essence of being. Breathe in. Picture your fear. Breathe out. Look your fear right in the face. Breathe in. Feel your fear. Breathe out. Taste your fear. Breathe in. Become your fear. Breathe out. Be your fear. Breathe in. Embrace your fear. Breathe out. Bathe your fear in love and light. Surrender by breathing in. Surrender your whole being into your true essence of love and light. Breathe out. Become your true essence of love and light. And please sit in silent meditation for just a few moments, feeling this love and light that is your true essence, your true nature, dissolving away the fear. And I want to thank you all this morning for having the courage and bravery to face your fear. And remember always what Seneca, the great Native American Iroquois leader, said, where fear is, happiness is not. Thank you.
Now let's move into our time of communion. Let us be still. We aspire to the heaven world. We seek the presence of the Most High. And there appears to our vision the form of the great Christ, bathed in a blazing aura of golden light. And we see his form in all of its beauty and radiance. We absorb the rays that are pouring down upon us all. He comes in beauty. He comes in gentleness, stretching forth his hand to bless. I come that you might have and recognize your own eternal life. He offers to each the symbol of the bread. Take the bread of his life and eat in spirit, for he gives us sustenance at every moment. He gives us new life, new hope, new love. And he holds in his hand the grail cup, And the heavens open, and the light pours down and fills the grail cup. And the lesser light shines from the grail cup. And to each of you, he offers the cup, the sacred grail cup, the wine, the symbol of his spirit, the essence of divine love and light. Sip this essence. Be purified in your heart. Be filled with all love and all light. And feel the divine fire flowing through you, cleansing, healing, and absolutely healing us from all fear, all pain, all confusion. Be still and know The Lord thy God is always with thee. Now, this service, this temple is filled, completely filled with the divine fire. And we are all one in spirit with a great company of shining ones, of shining angels. Those whom we love, those who have passed on, those who are now in the land of light. And while we are in the consciousness of the spirit, Our loved ones are always very close, closer than even they were while they were imprisoned in the human body, in the flesh, because in spirit there is absolutely no separation. So let joy fill our hearts. And now to God the Father, God the Mother, and God the Son, be praise and thanksgiving. Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, heaven and earth are absolutely full of thy praise. Glory to thee, almighty presence, for all things live in thee, and you live in all things. And all things can only live through your love. Amen. Amen.